It is now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Gordon Yee, the president of West Virginia University, who's known within West Virginia and certainly beyond for his visionary thinking. Dr. Gee has been an amazing supporter of the West Virginia Public Education Collaborative and its partners, as well as Focus Forward, who's been with us since the beginning. And Dr. Gee, we're looking forward to hearing your remarks today. Well, thank you very much, uh, Donna, and uh, to the Collaborative and to all the people who are, who are here with us. I am really delighted. I apologize, by the way, that I'm in, a, I'm in an airport. I have no idea what I'm doing here, but here I am. Um, yeah, and uh, grateful to be here, but the, but the collaborative has done a great work for West Virginia over the past, uh, what have we been doing now, Donna? It's five, six years, and um, it's been um, a way to knit together uh, great concepts, great ideas, and opportunities, and we certainly have done that. I think that the uh, Focus Forward process that we've developed gives people an opportunity to look uh, to the future um, and, and think about uh, all the possibilities of West Virginia, which are immense. Um, so I, I can tell you this, in, in, in the past year, um, uh, I've learned a lot, uh, but if it's taught us anything, it um, is that the path forward for, um, for West Virginia requires people willing to lead rather than follow. And, uh, and we certainly have seen that. If anyone had told me, for example, uh, last January that West Virginia University could become a totally online institution within two weeks, this massive uh, institution of 33,000 students, 30,000 plus uh, faculty and staff, uh, we could, could become totally online uh, within two weeks, I would have bet against that, but we did quite successfully, just as other schools around the country made a quick and uh, generally smooth transition to online learning. Uh, that emergency shift uh, shows that organizations can move with speed and agility when uh, our will, and I would say our courage to change is strong enough. Now, I can tell you this, no one understands that better than Brad Smith, executive board chairman and former CEO of Intuit. Um, Brad has cultivated uh, by any measure an agile, innovative culture and uh, helped his company improve the financial lives of customers around the world through products such as TurboTax and, um, and QuickBooks. And we all know about them now. Intuit is, by the way, consistently ranked in addition to being a great uh, Innovator, it is consistently ranked as one of the top 100 best places to work and among the most admired software companies in the world. Recently, Brad has turned his innovative vision to, uh, on his home state uh, and seen great potential for growth in our post-pandemic next normal, as I like to call it, which will include more remote, work, more remote workers, uh, uh, more than we have ever been able to imagine. As he told Fortune recently, People want to find a place where they can live, work, and play. They want to be surrounded by a community that is full of kind and diverse people, and they want to have the opportunity to be part of something new and fresh. And I think that's why West Virginia is really appealing to a lot of people. Couldn't agree with you more, Brad. Uh, it is uh, the perfect time and the perfect place to be located right now. Brad believes, by the way, in this vision so strongly that he and his wife, Elise, uh, have donated $25 million to our university to create the Brad and Elise Smith Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative. Their donation will provide uh, initial funding for a remote worker program. Um, and we're very excited about this um, because this groundbreaking initiative in partnership with the state aims to leverage West Virginia's outdoor assets, which are almost immeasurable to bring fresh talent to the mountain state. Although West Virginia faces stormy weather, uh, looking beyond the clouds also reveals opportunity to, to ignite our economy, to develop world-class recreational infrastructure and expand our outdoor educational programs. So to talk more about West Virginia um, and its future, um, I am terribly honored to be able to uh, introduce to you uh, Brad Smith. Brad, you inspire me.
Here you go, my friend. Thank you, President Gee. I really appreciate your leadership. I appreciate your friendship. And I appreciate that kind introduction. You know, what I will want to do is I want to first welcome everybody and wish you a happy St. Patty's Day. It's a sincere privilege to have the opportunity to engage with such an inspiring group of thought leaders and change agents. And I'm especially excited to tee up today's theme, Beyond the Cloud, because it frames a tremendous opportunity, a tremendous opportunity for West Virginia to build a competitive advantage while having a huge impact on society as well as our local economy. Now here in the Silicon Valley, we have a formula that we use to create the greatest breakthrough innovations, and it includes three critical steps. First, to find an important unsolved problem. Second, that you and those you enable can solve well together. And third, do this while building some source of competitive advantage. Now, finding the intersection of these three activities can be rare, but when it happens, it has a transformative impact for everyone involved. Companies such as Tesla, Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Intuit, and many others rely on this very approach to create value. And today's session is designed to showcase how the intersection between weather, big data, and West Virginia's assets and ingenuity are poised to capitalize on such an opportunity. So let me begin by teeing up the first element, the unsolved problem, which is the weather. Now, before we digress into jokes about West Virginia's weather or how infrequent our meteorologists may be right, I want to ground us in some facts. Extreme weather is an increasing liability for the U.S. economy and the local economy. In 2019, there were 14 weather-related events that caused more than a billion dollars in damage. In 2020, that number increased to 22 events. In West Virginia, we've suffered our fair share of these events from the thousand year storm several years ago to the more recent ice storms and flooding that led to power outages this season. Now the US government estimates that the weather impacts the national gross domestic product by more than $1 trillion a year. And that doesn't take into account the more than 400 deaths that occur annually because of severe weather events. Now I've chosen the word weather for this discussion, but I'm using this term interchangeably with climate change overall. But I'm focusing on weather because this discussion is less about why it's happening and more about the need to deal with the imminent realities of these events. Now with that backdrop, I'm gonna add one additional piece of information and it's around big data and advanced technology. With the ability to launch satellites and supercomputers and to harvest data from semi-autonomous vehicles and wearables like an Apple Watch, private weather companies are now emerging and they're leapfrogging the information gathering capabilities of our federal agencies. These companies are leveraging machine learning, artificial intelligence and cloud-based systems to do things like warn a railroad company if a tornado was on track to hit a specific portion of their railway or to warn a farmer when it's time to irrigate a particular row of crops, or to even tell an airline ground controller when they need to de-ice their plane or reschedule a flight because of a severe thunderstorm. Now these trends and these micro trends are challenging the National Weather Service to rethink how it tries to fulfill its mission of protecting lives and property. And it's this realization that the agency is now facing the prospect of operating more like a Silicon Valley platform company which means it needs to rely on the opportunity to partner with outside companies to both provide and receive the best data. This is just what Apple did when it opened up the iPhone for app developers. It's what Amazon did when it opened up the platform to third party resellers, as well as those that wanted to host on Amazon Web Services. And we all know those were groundbreaking decisions for those companies. It unleashed explosive growth, amazing valuations and drove up their market caps. That same moment has arrived for the National Weather Service. And that takes me to the second part of our innovation formula, solving the problem in ways that we and those that we enable can work together to solve well. Now I'm gonna share a little joke from the data science community. What's the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning? The answer, artificial intelligence is written in PowerPoint, machine learning is written in Python, which is a coding language. Said another way, artificial intelligence can be hype, and it only becomes real when machines are able to ingest, process, and learn from vast amounts of clean and actionable data. 
In fact, 90% of CEOs agree that data plus AI is a game changer. As a result, data has become the most valuable intellectual property in this current chapter of innovation. And I assure you, this is not science fiction. Many of the algorithms powering our economy today were written in the late 80s and early 90s, but they didn't work back then because they were starved for data. In fact, the late 80s and early 90s are now known as the AI winter. But in more recent years, this massive data and advances in computational processing, when you couple it with cheap memory, have unleashed a whole new era of potential. That's why we're now seeing significant leaps forward in everything from autonomous driving to medical breakthroughs. These companies have learned how to win in the world of artificial intelligence. And it's by paying attention to their data and capitalizing it on a source of competitive advantage. Now to do this, they've learned they need to supplement their own data with some external resources and much of which is now open sourced. And to gain access to that open source data, sometimes they have to contribute some of their own data to add value as well. Now this builds an ecosystem where the more who participate in the process contribute and create more value for everyone else involved. And the end result is a potential network effect. And that's something every company now seeks where the more people who join the network create more value for everyone else. And in return, it attracts more people to join and it builds this virtuous cycle that continues to accelerate in growth. Now, what does all this have to do with the weather? Well, I began my talk with the intersection between weather, big data, and West Virginia. The private weather industry is now booming. It's a $7 billion industry growing between 10 to 15% annually. And the challenge to date has been that it's been financially prohibitive for private weather companies to produce or collect the massive amounts of data required to allow those kinds of precision forecasts that I was talking about, like helping a railroad conductor or a farmer or an air airline. And since the National Weather Service is primarily focused on national level and macro trends, it has agreed to make its data freely available, allowing the private sector to use this information for these more precision purposes. Now, at the same time, the National Weather Service is going to benefit from this as well, because if its data is supplemented with private sector data, it will create a huge win-win at a national and a local level. In fact, the U.S. Department of Commerce estimates that this private weather industry that's starting to emerge could easily double from seven to $14 billion if data ingestion and sharing was made easier. The end result is society's going to win, innovation's gonna be sparked, economic upside will be created for all, just as it was for Apple, Amazon, and everyone else who moved to this open platform approach. And that brings me to the third and final part of my conversation, building durable competitive advantage and how West Virginia is uniquely positioned to do so. Because sitting in our I-79 technology park is NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, this site includes two satellite ground stations and a supercomputing center. These are major assets in NOAA's big data collection, management, and analytical operations. And in partnership with the biggest cloud providers, which include Amazon, Microsoft, and others, NOAA is making this data more accessible for the private industry to solve important problems that can create breakthrough innovations for society. Sitting here in the heart of our mountains, where the early pioneers of NASA were produced, those young rocket scientists depicted in the movie October Sky, those computational experts depicted in the movie Hidden Figures, our generation is facing the next significant opportunity as weather becomes an increasingly challenge to be solved and a business to be built. It is extremely rare to come across such a unique intersection where you can find a big problem that you and those you enable can work well together and build a durable competitive advantage in the process. But here we sit with this intersection happening in our own backyard. Without the need for our best and brightest to move to the East Coast or the Silicon Valley to participate, it's here for the pioneers on this call, the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the educators, the students, and all of us to seize this opportunity. And I'm incredibly excited about the possibilities that lie ahead. And I'm looking forward to discussing how we can capitalize on this moment together. And in doing so, help society while creating the next chapter for the state of West Virginia. So without further ado, I'm gonna wrap up my opening comments 
And I'm excited to take any questions you may have about the approach or the rest of today's agenda. Thank you so much, Brad. We always learn so much from you in such a, a straightforward way and taking away so many things today like the innovation formula and certainly excited about your belief in West Virginia to move forward with this. Now we would love to have audience uh, questions and answers and they go in the Q&A section, not the chat. Sometimes I know webinars do the chat, but we already have some that have been submitted. That's the great part. So I'll start out with the first one, Brad. How do you think West Virginia can get the most synergy out of the effort to make West Virginia a startup state and the opportunity in the climate and weather industry we're discussing today? Thank you, Donna, for the question. And I think it comes down to three things. It comes down to focusing on our people. The second, our assets and natural resources. And the third is letting the world know that there's a lot of exciting things happening in our state and they are welcome to come and be a part of that opportunity. So I'll start with our people. We are focusing our education right now on ensuring that this next generation understands the entrepreneurial skills, the critical thinking skills, and have that sort of design thinking approach that the Silicon Valley and so many other successful sectors around the world have capitalized on. So West Virginia University has leaned in aggressively in this area, as has Marshall University and our K-12 system, and we're making sure our next generation is prepared to participate in the 21st century. The second are our assets, and there are our natural resources, which President Gee spoke about, the amazing outdoor activities, but also there's assets like NOAA, where we're sitting here and we have these amazing opportunities for entrepreneurs to begin to innovate and solve important problems for the world. And then last but not least is inviting others to come and be a part of this. West Virginia, whether it's through the remote worker program that we're announcing, or it's the fact that the state has always been welcoming and hoping that people will come in and kind of roll up their sleeves and be a part of this next chapter is open for business. And I think it's those three things in combination that will create a flywheel because we'll have the talent that we're growing inside, the talent we're attracting from outside, and the amazing assets for them to work within to create the next wave of innovation. Thank you so much, Brad. We have a couple more and I think there's more coming in. Uh, what are your thoughts as to the most difficult challenge to overcome if you're someone with a good idea and you want to start a business and um, one or two ideas on how to address that challenge? Well, I think, first of all, there's a misnomer about how to start a business. Many people say, I don't have an idea, so how am I going to start a business? And when you actually discuss this with founders, they very seldom succeeded on their first idea. Instead, they fell in love with a problem and they researched it, then they learned and they learned and they learned. And then ultimately, once they came up with something that they thought they had some in-market evidence, they would act. And so I would say, as someone who's looking around saying, I wanna be an entrepreneur, I wanna participate, don't count yourself out. Don't assume because you don't have an immediate idea that you don't have an opportunity to be an entrepreneur. Instead, find a problem that nags you to death in your life and then ask if other people have the same problem and that problem isn't getting solved well by existing solutions and then begin to think about what are all the ways you could solve that problem. And this is a part of design thinking. It's called seven to one. Don't come up with one idea, come up with seven ideas that could solve that problem and then begin to see which one has the most promise and that's the one you double down on. So that's what I would say to an entrepreneur. Don't count yourself out. Don't say, hey, I don't have an idea. Instead, look for an important problem you think the world needs to have solved and begin to think about ways you could solve that problem and get going. Very good, thank you. Okay, um, there were a couple questions around education. And one came from Scott Roadtruck, uh, who's the chair of our PEC and uh, you know member of the state board. And also uh, educators kind of had the same idea. We know that education is playing and should play a major role in our next step. But how do we get education to take an urgency approach to creating the synergy necessary for the state to move forward? Like, what is the most important step education needs to take? You know, I will first start by saying I am the proud participant of a public school system coming out of West Virginia, K through 12, and then Marshall University. And it has served me incredibly well. Everywhere I've gone around the world, people have said, how do you feel about your education coming out of West Virginia? And I say, I've learned that I, I learned the same things you did in school. 
The only difference is yours cost $150,000 more than mine and we had a better football team. <laughs> I'll pull back and talk about the reality of what I think our education system at large needs to embrace. I refer to the four D's and the four C's. The four D's are the four critical skills we have to infuse in the next generation for them to actively participate in a world where you have things like big data and artificial intelligence. Those four D's are design thinking, which is basically the Silicon Valley techniques of falling in love with the problem, experimenting your way to the answer. The second D is developer acumen. Just as we had to learn to write in cursive, even though many of us did not become journalists and, and poets, I think this next generation needs to understand at least one course, if not two, how to translate ideas into code. The third is design as a craft, which is another way of saying arts. Technology is complicated, it's intimidating, and only when it's made easy does it become useful. That's why the iPhone is so amazingly adopted because it's so simple for everyone to learn. And then the fourth D is data analytics. And clearly where you're talking about NOAA, you wanna talk about money ball and managing a baseball team, you have to understand how to find patterns and truth in the data. So those are the four skills our educators hopefully will begin to infuse into our curriculum. And those are again, design thinking, developer acumen, art and design as a craft applied to the new technology and last but not least data analytics. And then I think how we teach has to continue to adapt and evolve. We need to begin to think a lot more about a connected classroom, whether it's distance learning in class or hybrid. The second is we need to engage our community. So no longer just solve these case studies that are Acme widgets, but instead go downtown to the local small business owner, ask them what they're wrestling with, bring that problem into the classroom and let the students do a real case study on that. And hopefully the results will improve the business results and the students will learn. And then the third and fourth C for me are trying to focus more on competency versus credit hour. I hope we get off this four-year college and bust. And instead, we start to think about all the ways that Votech and others can contribute and be a part of this 21st century. And then last but not least, I hope we put more energy into completion rates, which is helping people fully get through the education process so they don't walk around labeled as a dropout. And there's some innovative ways of doing that that we can learn from people around the world. So I know that's a long answer, but I've spent a lot of time thinking about it and trying to learn from others. And I call it the four D's and four C. That's not a passing scorecard if you take it home or report card to your parents. But I do think in there are some elements of opportunity for education. Thank you, Brad. And it's exciting to hear you talk about design thinking because on April 22nd, we're planning a follow-up to Focus Forward and we'll have Marshall University uh, training us on that. So we're excited about that. Okay, more questions. West Virginia has had not many, if any, opportunities to participate in the multi-billion dollar knowledge sector expansion. How important do you think it is for the state to develop a vibrant knowledge sector? And how do we do that? How does the state build a business case to drive that knowledge sector? You know, the knowledge sector is one of these terms that can cause us to either qualify ourselves or disqualify ourselves. And while it is absolutely true that this next chapter requires a new set of skills, those skills don't rule out our hands and they don't rule out our heart. And that's where West Virginia has also excelled in its past. But in today's world, instead of Votech trying to figure out how to tune a carburetor when cars don't even have a carburetor in many cases now, we need to teach how to work with an electronic vehicle and how to actually work on robotics that'll be in Amazon's warehouses and how to use those technical skills. So that requires a different set of knowledge, but the same heart and the same hands that West Virginians bring. So what I would say is for us to participate, we need to step back and say, what are the new technologies, the new tools, the new screwdrivers, if you will, that I need to become familiar with? And then how do I apply that knowledge to the future? And so I would simply say this, in West Virginia, many times we say, why? Why can I participate? When I came to the Silicon Valley, the question people ask here is, why not? And so I hope West Virginia starts to say, why not? Why not be a part of this and just lean in and do what we've always done? Just be completely innovative and creative. 
Thank you, Brad. Okay, the next question is, one of the primary technologies driving this climate and weather opportunity is big data analytics. We talked about that last year a lot at Focus Forward. Do you think West Virginia could become a player in this bigger market by leveraging this climate and weather opportunity? Absolutely. Absolutely, Donna. That was the thesis I was hoping to share in my opening comments. This big data opportunity, and especially as it relates to weather, we know that weather change is a secular challenge that's going to face generations for many, many years ahead, if not centuries. So this is a big unsolved problem that we're all trying to get our heads around. All the world leaders, all the meteorologists, all the big data scientists, all the major tech companies. And it's very rare that you find yourself in a situation where you're sitting in a small piece of geography where you got some of the world's greatest assets in your backyard. That gives you a playground to begin to go in and try to test and run experiments. And this industry is already a $7 billion industry growing 10 to 15%. You know, the economy is going to have this return boom this year, and many people are forecasting it could grow 6%. This is going to be like the roaring 20s at 6%. Imagine 10 to 15%. So we should capitalize on this opportunity, seize it while it's still early in its makings and learn how to be a part of this opportunity going forward. Very good. This question kind of piggybacks on that. It says, it seems the data has evolved to become the most valuable asset that we know for government and the private sector organizations. How should we incorporate this reality into our educational system? I think it goes back to my response earlier about education, the four D's and the four C's. We need to really put an emphasis on math, data analytics and statistics and find a way to make it fun. This is one of the exciting things about the Outdoor Economic Development Collaborative that's happening at West Virginia University where they developed a science adventure camp where they teach middle school kids how to learn about science, technology, engineering, math through outdoor activities. A zip line is physics. How does this mountain bike work? What's the science behind the bike? And as we get kids to understand these aren't just memorizing multiplication tables, it's a fun way to apply it to the things that happen around them every day in their life. They're going to fall in love with data. And so I think for us, we have to find creative ways to have students fall in love with some of these areas that in the past people might have said, oh, that's not for me. And now show them it's a very exciting thing to be a part of. I love, as a teacher, I love to hear you say, fall in love with it, because that's really what it takes to go yes. into something like that. Okay, shifting to another question, what revenue models do you foresee for the private weather forecast using that? You know, this is an unanswered question. And if you think about the approach of design thinking, and I talked about this a little in my opening comments, there are four toll gates you go through to launch a successful business, and every company has gone through them. The first three, you don't even worry about how you're going to make money. It's only the fourth. So the first is you find a big, important problem. You come up with at least seven different ways to solve it. You run experiments and you narrow in on one. And the first toll gate is, did that one solution that I put out in the market, did it create customer benefit in such a way that they're actively using it in their daily life and they're starting to tell their friends and family about it, even though I haven't officially launched it? That's called a unit of one or the love metrics. Then the second is if that starts to work, you roll it out to a broader group called cohorts and you see if you get that same multiplier effect where they're saying, this is so amazing, I'm gonna tell my friends and family, it starts to create viral growth. It's only at that second stage that you say, will anyone ever pay me for this? You get to the third stage and you say, now I'm going to put that solution up against the existing things in the market. How does it stack up against others trying to do this and see if I'm starting to get a faster adoption or downloads than they are. And that's when you actually do a dry test. You put a little pay window up that says, click here and give me your credit card. And you test multiple ways to charge for that, a subscription, a one-time download, a buy the drink model, whatever your model is, you test to see which one creates the most revenue. Once you've got that figured out and you have the love metrics proven, you go to the fourth toll gate, which is your right of business plan. You don't worry about how to make money or a business plan until the fourth toll gate. First, prove the product works, then prove somebody's going to be willing to pay you and then go after the revenue. Wow, that's, that's great. 
Okay, another question. How do you see the democratization of data from NOAA empowering entrepreneurs to solve larger problems organizations face rather than leaving the data under private organizations? Well, this is one of these things that the Silicon Valley and many other industries have learned, and we learned the hard way. We started out in the early days as walled gardens, closed systems. We considered everything proprietary, and then when you get into the world of the consumer or the small business, the average small business uses 18 apps to run their business. And if those apps do not work with each other, you have not helped a small business with your one little sliver, you've created friction in their life. So this is where Apple, who originally launched the iPhone with a half a dozen apps, said there's no way I could solve all the potential opportunities and problems out there. And they opened up the iPhone to app developers and there's over a billion apps now. And the same thing happened with Amazon. They were trying to become the world's biggest store and they had warehouses if they couldn't keep all the things that they needed. So they opened it up to third party resellers. And now you can find anything out there on Amazon. And this is the same opportunity with NOAA. These private weather companies certainly have amazing local data. The National Weather Service has huge amounts of national data. And if we start to bring those together, we can get a win-win for both. So we have to think about growing the pie and not protecting my piece of the pie. And that's the mindset shift everyone has to embrace. Thank you. Okay, I'm leaving out all the parts of these questions where people are telling you how much they your message is resonating and how much they appreciate it. So I want you to know there's a lot of love in there, but I'm going straight to the question. Okay, you mentioned the critical importance of a team to solving larger problems. Can you share your views on how West Virginia's public and private sectors can come together to solve some of our historically intractable challenges like broadband so that we can actually advance entrepreneurship in West Virginia? Yes, and this is actually a lesson we've learned from our special forces in the military. General Stanley McChrystal is a dear friend of mine. He led the Joint Special Operations Command in the War on Terror. And he has a model that's very clear and very simple. And it's one we've applied in the Silicon Valley because he advised me and a lot of other companies. And it's got four pieces. The first is you have to have a common purpose. Set another way, one plan. Not everybody's individual plan, but one plan for the greater good, in this case, the state of West Virginia. The second then is you have to have shared consciousness, which means everyone shares data freely. So everyone has access to the same information so we can all act on that information. The third is empowered execution, which is you get really clear about what are the frames that you want people to operate in. In other words, we wanna solve broadband and it needs to be done in three years. It needs to be a mosaic of solutions. And we also have to make it affordable for consumers. Those are the only constraints. Now go innovate. And then the fourth is trust. And he breaks down trust very simply. Assume competence in your partner. In other words, assume they know how to do what they're doing. And the second is be benevolent in your own actions. Serve them before you serve yourself. If you actually have a master plan where everyone shares the data freely, everyone understands what the constraints are and people trust each other, this machine will move quickly. And I see West Virginia doing this, by the way. I see us working across the aisle. I see universities partnering. K through 12 opening up and saying, what can we do differently? I think we are unique and rare and we should capitalize on this. Thank you. Okay, how important do you feel it is to innovators of the intellectual property protection? This is an interesting concept that I think at the end of the day is one of the opportunities West Virginia can really seize. Intellectual property, especially in today's world, many people will say, was well, there anything left to patent? And the answer is, are you kidding me? We have so much innovation ahead of us, but now it starts to become more of the intangibles, the algorithm that you write, which is basically the rule that's going to use the data to turn it into something magic. That needs to be patented. And if you patent that, then it becomes something others need to work with you to license or to share. And so IP, intellectual property and patents are an important part of this, but you don't get to the IP portion until you've done the love metrics for a larger group of people, You've proven somebody's going to pay it. You've written a business plan and you make sure that you then are ready to IP it. Excellent. The IP. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, data regulation is part of the future. What can we do to make sure that West Virginia's elected representatives and public servants have the knowledge and the data savvy they need? You know, this is one where I've spent a lot of time in D.C. and in Brussels in the role that I've had it into it. 
And it starts with a set of data stewardship principles. And for us, we believe very simply, it's not our data, it's the customer's data. And we're simply stewards of their data. And we never use that data without their permission. And we never use it in ways they haven't told us they want us used. In other words, we never share the data with anyone. You can never de-aggregate it to get it down to personally identifiable information. And we only use it in ways that improve their life. I think it's that simple. And I know many times we get into the details of a lot of the nuances, but if you can go back to, we are stewards of our individual citizens data, and we will only do what the citizen wants us to do. And we will be very transparent about that. And we will ask their permission. Everything else flows out of that. And that would be as simple as I would try to keep it. And I think that that will guide all of us from a sort of true North perspective. Great. This is a similar question, but really an important question because we always, when we have focus for want to have um, takeaways for our legislators, our governor. And the question is, what message would you have for the West Virginia legislature, the governor and our congressional delegation regarding how they could help our state capitalize on this opportunity? And I think many of those people are in the audience today. And I thank those people. I've spoken to many of them. I am absolutely encouraged and impressed with the way they're leading. And I love the fact they're seeking ideas from outside. And that is an amazing first step. If I go through this, whether it's NOAA, it's remote work, it's an entrepreneurial startup state that we're trying to cultivate, it's distance learning, it's telemedicine, it all comes down to one thing, ubiquitous broadband connectivity for every house in Holler. And so if there was anything that I hope our state is working together in unison to do, we don't have 10 years to solve this. The world's moving too quickly. COVID accelerated everything three to five years. I would lean in with every ounce of energy we have and come up with a mosaic of solutions to get broadband connectivity to every house and every hauler in our state. And that will unlock big data for NOAA. That will unlock the cloud computing resources from Amazon and Microsoft and everything else we want. It certainly resonates with all of us. Thank you. How can the program you graciously funded at WVU to encourage remote workers to come to West Virginia be applied to the opportunity in the climate and weather, um, as well as in the bigger data analytics? That's the exciting thing about this remote worker program. It, it does target people who are gainfully employed today, but also have this sort of navigating, pioneering, experiential lifestyle where they love to be out in the outdoors and they love to think about the next path they're going to create instead of a trail they're going to follow. And so many times, if you study these remote worker programs from around the country, you'll see these people move here with a job, they'll be a part of the community, they'll spend their purchasing power in our local stores and they'll help get our schools stronger. They'll be all the things we want a good citizen to be but then sometimes they'll start to look around and say, hey, I see something that I might want to start. And that's where when you have the Virgin Hyperloop or you have NOAA or you have things happening all around the state where they'll say, I want to be a part of that as well. So I think getting the talent in who already have those four Ds, they've already gone to school for that while we're growing the next generation in our schools and then having these exciting assets in their backyard like NOAA, that's going to create a real flywheel effect where the talent meets the problem and it creates opportunity for the state. Thank you. You mentioned machine learning. What opportunities and applications are you seeing related to blockchain? Is blockchain more than a fad? And are you seeing educational institutions embrace teaching, research, blockchain? Yeah, blockchain is very real. And without getting too deep into the technical aspects of it, blockchain is the architecture upon which things like cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and everything else is built. There will be a lot that has to get sorted out in cryptocurrency. But blockchain itself is the new way of making sure that you can have a safe, secure, and accountable system for technology going forward. And I would absolutely, if I was in the education system, be leaning in, making our students aware of this. And for those who choose computer science, going deeper, because it will be the architectural fabric upon which the next financial services banking system is built and all the new FinTech solutions are also being created. Excellent. Will the Brad D. Smith Incubator at Marshall University be putting an emphasis on startups around climate weather businesses? The neat thing about that incubator is we don't choose the businesses. We actually let the businesses come in and we try to help them facilitate their ideas. And right now we have a major anchor tenant that's focused on cybersecurity and protecting data. 
So there's a natural synergy to have that sit next to someone who's working on the private weather industry and the NOAA data assets. So I would tell you, we're open for business. I hope businesses who want to do that come into the incubator and we will help you through that process. Great, thank you. What investments can West Virginia make to build the basis for technology industry companies that want to come to West Virginia, especially considering our around 50th place ranking in educational attainment? You know, this is one of these questions I've been asked many, many years. And for those of us who are from West Virginia that had a chance to move someplace else and then run a company, they always ask, well, when are you going to open an office here? You know, really, people choose where they're going to open offices based upon a couple things. An education system and the talent that comes out with the skills that are employment ready. The second is that they have the broadband connectivity, the healthcare services, the transportation, and all the other things that are required to have an effective and efficient sort of work environment. And I think our state is working on that now, but the way to go after that is instead of trying to attract a business with a tax break, attract their employees with remote workers, and then the businesses are going to say, why are all my employees wanting to move to West Virginia? Maybe I should have an office there. I now have 25 or 30 of them sitting right there. Maybe we should start recruiting there because that seems to be the place everybody wants to be. So instead of this push model of trying to get the business there and give them a bunch of breaks, let's create broadband. Let's create this entrepreneurial ecosystem. Let's bring the remote workers here. And trust me, they will come exciting to hear too. Um, as weather and climate pertain to the tourism industry with the addition of the new National Park in Fayette County, how can rural communities in Fayette and Kanawha take advantage to increase tourism in these areas to develop and grow? I think the tourism industry right now and in particular in West Virginia is going to see explosive growth, especially coming out of COVID. And then if you look at the amazing work that Chelsea Ruby and her team are doing, and then you put that in conjunction with this remote worker program, there's going to be a massive spotlight being shined on West Virginia. And I think it's going to be an amazing opportunity for people to see this beautiful new park. Well, not a new park, newly designated park, all the amazing assets we have with all kinds of incentives to come and give us a try. And I think when people come to West Virginia, they're not going to want to go back home. They're going to want to make it their new home. Now, when you tap that into NOAA and the private weather industry and how that ties in to the tourism opportunity. That's a great idea for an entrepreneur somewhere on this call to say, how can I go in and tackle a problem that will tie to the tourism industry? Because I know that the governor and Chelsea's leaning into that. That could be the new business idea for me. So I would think about that as you approach today's session. And then you think about the design workshop that Donna, you mentioned is coming up here in a couple of weeks. Thank you. This is probably, there's, there's more questions, but we, we can answer them offline. But one more question, and you address some of this. As a parent, how should I be guiding my kids to learn so they're prepared for these opportunities like big data? I would encourage them to learn by doing, to experience things, to ask the why behind that works. And that will teach them how to fall in love with why things work and why things work increasingly will be rooted in things like technology and math. And don't let any gender bias come into this. Women and girls actually test more advanced in the early years of their education in math and science than men. And then after the third grade, all the way up to the eighth grade, their hands start to go down and they start to say, maybe that's not for me. We need to open it up to all of our children and help them understand and experience through things like the Science Adventure School, through design thinking at Marshall University, through our own parenting to say, why do you think that works the way it does? Just spark that inquisitive sort of intuitive side of them, and then they'll fall in love with the things that our educators will be ready to teach them. Thank you. Well, Brad, beyond this venue, how do you think we get your message to the masses? You inspire us today, you know, but we want to know how to tune in. We want to let other people, how do we market your message to everyone? Well, I think it's the collective we, and we are doing that. And I think you can tell from me, I'm not shy with words. I'm a little overly verbose. So uh, I have been singing from every rooftop about the greatest secret in the world is West Virginia. The greatest people in the world are West Virginia and the greatest assets in the world are West Virginia. We're about to unleash that. We're going to be talking about it with the startup state. We're going to be talking about it with remote work. We're going to be talking about it with NOAA. 
Virgin Hyperloop. There are so many things coming our way. We've got amazing elected officials in Washington. We have amazing officials in the state. So just lean in and be a part of it and believe. Because believe me, I absolutely love people who dream and then know it will come true. There are two kinds of people in this world, in my opinion, those who have to see it to believe it and those who believe it and then they see it. We need to be the second group. Well, okay, I would like to now welcome back Brad D. Smith, who's emceeing our next session with presentations from Amazon Web Services and Microsoft, sharing how we can engage with cloud providers in this space. Welcome back, Brad. Thank you, Donna. And I also want to thank Zach and John. That was an amazing overview of this, the tremendous assets that we have to work with as entrepreneurs to try to solve important problems for society. I'm humbled by the work that they're doing on behalf of just mankind, period, but also the opportunities they're bringing to the state. So I want to thank both Zach and John. And Donna, just like the old Jaws movie, just when you thought it was safe to go back in the water, somehow I reappear. So I apologize for those in the audience. We're hoping that you had heard enough of me, but really it's not about me at this point. Uh, it's an opportunity for me to host two amazing leaders who are being a part of this partnership and trying to make sure that the data that NOAA has made available can be easily accessed for the private sector and made actionable into solutions that can solve important problems. And we're going to approach this panel one at a time. First and foremost, it is my privilege to introduce our first guest panelist, Zach Flamig. Zach is the tech lead for Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. Zach has a PhD in meteorology. He focuses on forecasting flash floods in the United States. Zach is committed to democratizing earth science data to ensure that science analysis can be done quickly on it so that we can solve the important problems facing society today. And he works hard as a part of Amazon Web Services to make sure that that data is both easy to share and easy to access in the cloud. So without further ado, Zach, I would like to welcome you to the panel and I'll turn it over to you for some opening comments. Thanks, Brad. I'll just share a few slides here real quick. I share my screen, get that going. Uh, it's shared, okay. So I just want to talk a little bit about um, what we're actually doing at Amazon Web Services and how we're <clears throat> um, helping sort of the, the open data space and the sustainability space as well. So I'll talk a little bit about the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative here. Um, so this is really promoting innovation for sustainability. And so one of the things that we've noticed and that we uh, really like is this quote from Data Driven by DJ Patil and Hillary Mason. So DJ was the former chief data officer of the US. And it says that data must be organized, well-documented, consistently formatted and error-free. Cleaning the data is often the most taxing part of data science and it's frequently 80% of the work. And so what this means for us is that when you're getting these data sets and you're working with these data sets and you're starting trying to figure out how to use them and the tooling and all of that, that what you're seeing is that there's actually a lot of um, uh, undifferentiated heavy lifting. And so that's something that Amazon really likes to, re to remove for our customers, right? As we want our customers to, to come and be able to build the solutions that are of value to them. And so I will point out that you know, we help that with the infrastructure side of things, providing over 175 services for folks to use to work with the data. But if you're you know, thinking about starting a business and, and all of that, there still is a lot of value here in this space, right? That you're looking at all of Noah's data and you're looking at that and you're looking at what are the things that people are gonna value for it. It's really this 80% of the work still, right? And so if you're looking to come and start something, um, that's one area that you could potentially focus on. So a little bit more about the, the data initiative and what we're trying to do there. Um, so we're really working to significantly uh, reduce the cost, time and technical barriers associated with analyzing large data sets, specifically to generate sustainability insights. So that can be anything around you know, weather, disaster response and climate change. Um, and so one of the tools that we have to help facilitate that is the AWS Open Data Program. Um, so I'm also on the AWS Open Data team where I mainly focus on weather and climate data. Um, so the uh, help run the open data program with that regard. And so one of the things that we're able to do there is we're really able to help democratize access to data by covering the cost of storage for those data sets, specifically for data sets that are um, high value. So they're gonna see a lot of usage in the community. So everyone's sort of after them, which that's actually a lot of NOAA's data sets, right? So if you look at sort of the, the data sets that everyone's after these days, it's model forecasts, it's satellite data, it's radar data, um, the things that were already discussed. And so we're helping the community develop new techniques and new formats for storing that data and being able to work with that data so that they can utilize them for lower cost and access them faster on the cloud. 
Um, so a lot of that is sort of this, uh, what we call cloud native technologies. And there are some examples of this, things like cloud optimized geotiffs, where um, our community figured out and we figured out that if you store data in geotiffs in a certain way in a certain tile format, it let you actually retrieve the data in a much faster way so that you could actually retrieve the data you wanted for the analysis you were doing and not get a whole bunch of extra data. And so those are some of the examples of the, the techniques that we're working on. We're working with the community to help develop around these data sets so they can do more of the data um, for lower cost. And we're also encouraging the development of the communities. And so this is something where, you know, coming here and giving presentations like this, we're really helping build up these communities. We're helping to tell the stories. We're helping to find out, you know, what are their problems? What are their needs? And how can we be a further assistance? So I'll just give a few examples of some things that our customers are doing inside our communities. Um, so we have six great examples here. So we'll just talk briefly about them. Um, so we have Soulcast, who's looking at Go 16 data and the Himawari 8 data. And they're using that for forecasting solar power um, production. So what they're really looking at is, you know, one of the, the challenges with managing power grids, especially with renewables, right, is are you going to have enough power to meet demand? Should you be storing excess power now? Things like that. And so they're able to forecast, you know, where is cloud cover going to be at a specific time? And so they're able to see how is the generation network going to change, um, especially thinking about not just the big solar plants, but as you get a distributed grid, right, the power companies are going to have, power utilities are going to have power coming in from a variety of places. They're going to need to know sort of accurate information on how much power they can expect to be generated. So Soulcast is really working towards that using the data that's made available by NOAA. Uh, <clears throat> John O'Neill already talked a little bit about Himawari 8, so I won't go into that a whole lot. But it's just very cool to see sort of the expansion of the, the partnership of data, right? That the work NOAA is doing is actually driving others to realize the value of the cloud. Um, so NOAA is producing the Himawari data and putting it on the cloud, but their partners at the Japanese Meteorological Agency also saw the value of that and we're, and we're getting excited and are thinking about, you know, are there other data sets they could share? Are there other applications for this and that sort of thing? Uh, we have another example of producing sort of geodiverse training data. So this is really around the machine learning problem. And so this is a group, uh, Radiant Earth Foundation, that's helping produce these training data sets with Sentinel and Landsat 8 data sets so that you can look at um, crop, crop types and um, basically being able to do machine learning detection for what's growing in a field and what is the health of that crop. And so it's really cool that they're producing these training data sets. They're open sourcing them, open accessing them so everyone can come and benefit them. So you can build machine learning models much quicker using that. Um, so that's a really cool success story utilizing the data as well. Uh, we also have this AWS cloud to restore ecosystems. So this is Dendra. And so they really pitch this as sort of ecosystems as a service. So they're working in Australia specifically after the brush fires there and looking at ecosystem restoration, right? So they're able to use the satellite data. They're able to see which areas burned and then they're able to figure out, you know, how are they being remediated? Are, they, are the animals coming back? Is vegetation coming back? What type of vegetation is coming back? to be able to track that so that um, governments, municipalities can make informed decisions about remediation efforts they need. Uh, we also have 427, and so they're leveraging the cloud to do these rapid climate risk assessments. Um, so this is something that's becoming uh, ever more popular, you're seeing as the, as the volume of data is uh, becoming more available and increasing. And also as you're seeing these more high impact weather events that people are trying to understand how is our risk gonna change in the future? Um, so this is a great group that's doing that on, on AWS using um, a lot of the data that we have uh, that's available through the open data program and finally we have digital earth africa and so this is really a project in africa um, around their building basically open data cubes over africa so they're using satellite information to look at land cover change land use change and um, just sort of general land change so one of the cool things that they can do with that is they can monitor uh, water uh, surface water and see where has it been historically um, with these so they have the, the whole idea of sort of the uh, data cube is that you can look backwards in time easily and so you can understand, you know, has there ever been water here? Or is there just water here now? And so that means that you can see, like, how is your lake performing in this drought? Um, you know, is it at, at very low levels historically relative to historical values and whatnot? You can also see other things like the creation of dams. So you can sort of monitor those as well, um, including, you know, dams that are not permitted and things like that. Um, so it's a great resource for, for governments to be able to monitor sort of their country and water in their country uh, is just one of the applications. So those are the few examples. That's really all I had to sort of discuss today with the Amazon Sustainability Data Initiative. Um, but I think Brad, who had some more pointed questions for us as well. I'll just say here, here are a few links. So there's obviously my email if you wanna reach out to me. Um, we have a few links to our web pages as well that you'll be able to grab from here. Wow, Zach, thank you for that overview. It was both incredibly understandable for someone who's never written a line of code in his life but also amazingly impactful. When you see the kinds of things entrepreneurs are partnering with you to do, 
whether it's solar panels or it's the opportunity to understand climate and weather or the vegetation and the forests and the animals or all the other things that you walk through. It's just an important piece of our society and it affects all of us in some way, shape or form. So thank you for walking through that. Um, I did have some questions that I wanted to tee up and then see if you could share a perspective. And I wanna start with what I just kind of let in with, which is my own skill set. Sometimes people in the audience are students or they may not be someone who has worked with big data and they start to ask themselves, does this topic have anything to do with me? Is it relevant? And I'm a classic example of someone who's made a career in the technology sector and not being a computer scientist because we know that many different skills come together to actually create an entrepreneurial opportunity. Can you share what skills you think could take advantage of an opportunity like this as we talk about what you're doing at AWS and what NOAA is making available? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's really like, I think there, there are a lot of skills, right? Because it's really, you know, not just the coding expertise, right? The coding expertise isn't going to help, actually help you um, start a business and things like that uh, completely, right? You need to understand the problem that someone wants to solve. And so, you know, for that, you need other skills, you need knowledge of other domains, you know, so someone who has sort of a a business background, for example, that understands, oh, hey, you know, we're going to have to report on climate risk in the future uh, because that's being mandated, right? And so, you know, they're going to need to go look at the data that NOAA's making available, right, or or have some resources to do that. So it's really sort of a, a figuring out, you know, what are the problem space that people are interested in. Um, the solar power is another sort of great example of that, right, where you may not think about that as a, a business um, opportunity immediately, if it's sort of that, um, but, you know, you're looking at at folks who have this need, you know, power utilities have this great need to be able to understand how much energy is their grid going to produce, right? And so then you're like, oh, how can I figure that out from all of this data? And actually all the data is out there if you, if you know where to look and know how to sort of put it together. Um, so those are just sort of two examples um, uh, from the top of my head. But I'll also say that, you know, like if you look at sort of the, the big data skills and things like that, if you are someone who's more interested in sort of the, the big data problems and are thinking about that and are coding in that, um, a lot of the tooling that you'll need and you'll see in these communities is sort of the same across disciplines and across verticals. Um, so folks that are working on solving environmental big data problems, um, they use very similar tools to folks that are trying to cure cancer. Um, so there's, you know, the fundamentals of sort of working with big data are, are the same, right? You have this idea of, oh, we have these big objects, we need someplace to store them, and then we need tools to do distributed computing on them. Um, the actual libraries that you see at sort of the, the lower levels look a lot of bit the same, right? So um, for example, um, just to name some of the technologies, right? Like you look at Spark and, and Dask and Python and, and Julia and R and things like that. Like those skills are all basically transportable across the domain that you're working in. Um, so that's why even folks who are here today who are maybe not interested in environmental challenges but are interested in other big data challenges can benefit, right? Um, you can come and look at these communities. You can see what they're doing. You can see what tools they're doing. Um, for example, we're producing a lot of tutorials on how to get started quickly with all of these things so you don't have to spend a lot of time fighting with the technology, or at least that's what we're aiming for, right? We're trying to let people come in and be able to solve their problems quickly, um, or at least get a, a grasp of the problem, right? And start to understand how they can use the data to solve that. And, you know, if you look at an example from what we're doing in meteorology or, or climate or anything like that, you can easily um, change those examples to work with other big data sets as well. Wow, Zach, that was incredibly helpful. And I just want to summarize some of the main aspects of what you shared. Of course, this is a rich playing field of opportunity for computer scientists, for data scientists, but it's also a rich playing field of opportunity for those who see problems that need to be solved and they can go find someone who has those skills, say, let's work on this together. And also for those that are in the arts and design, because as you saw from some of the presentations that both Zach and John shared, visualization of that data to make it operationable and informing someone to make judgment. And I love the example of it's humans plus computers that deliver the greatest outcome. It's, it's augmented intelligence as opposed to artificial intelligence. And so all of us have a part to play. And I love how you opened up the aperture with some very tangible examples. So Zach, I'd love to ask you as entrepreneurs are sitting out there right now and you have a really broad purview of all the different activity happening and you just shared six, six examples a couple minutes ago. Is there a particular area that you would suggest an entrepreneur may want to focus on right now to say, let me tell you the problem on the horizon that we see that could be something really interesting for people to go put their energy and their focus against? Um, I would just say sort of looking at what I see others doing right in sort of the big areas right now. So a lot of that is around climate risk. So you're seeing a lot of growth there, a lot of new companies there, a lot of um, trying to understand that. One of the big reasons for that is um, there's a 
a relatively new data set called the uh, CMAP6, so it's the coupled model, model internet comparison project, um, sort of the sixth generation of that. And so that's where all of the national climate modeling centers and, and universities and other groups that do climate modeling, they all get together and they agree, hey, let's run these simulations using our models. Um, so they sort of predefine what the simulations look like in terms of the scenarios. So they say, you know, we expect this much growth in greenhouse gases, for example, and they everyone runs that through with their models. Their models have different physics, they produce different outcomes, but then you put them and you pool them all together. And so the, the pool of all that model data is uh, what's called CMAP6. And so that's, you know, a 20 plus petabyte data set that's out there for analysis. And that has things like future temperatures for the next 100 years in it, for example. Um, sometimes at hourly resolution. It has things like how is uh, the, it has precipitation in it. And so from that, you can look at how is precipitation going to change in the future and, and all of that, right? And so you're seeing you have this wealth of, of data out there that is open for analysis for people to come and basically use to answer the questions that they have, which is, you know, is my property going to flood more in the future? Um, if I'm going to build a new warehouse, you know, where should I best site it so that I'll have access to water in the future? So that, you know, some of the, the problems that you see that our um, companies are up against, right, is they're, you know, building new locations, new, um, some, for example, data centers and locations um, that are maybe subject to droughts in the future. And so then they'll have to be challenged by, okay, we can't use water for cooling our data centers anymore, um, or potentially we won't be able to use water in some events, right? And so we need to know that. And so we need to have a backup plan in for, you know, when this region goes into a drought, how are we going to cool our data center so that we're not taking water that people need? Um, and so, you know, those are sorts of the questions that people are trying to answer, right? And they're building companies around that. You see a lot of companies um, coming up around that, um, you know, and they're looking at various aspects of the problem, like the problem space is quite large. Um, so I just named sort of water and drought, but you can look at floods, obviously, you can look at wildfire risk, uh, you can look at heat stress, right? And so, you know, if you look at um, companies that have a lot of outside workers and, and outside engagement, think about, you know, lawn maintenance, things like that. Um, you know, you're sort of looking at, you know, how can we help them be more prepared for that? Maybe they need to be um, approaching different regions or they're going to need more cooling technology for their workers to be able to give them longer breaks in the shade. Um, so we want to understand how that will impact our business in the future. And so you're seeing a lot of startups come because each, you know, each startup is going to answer uh, a specific question in there or they're going to have different applications of the data sets and how do we solve that problem, right? So you have this vast pool of 20 petabytes of data. There's going to be more than one way to get the answer out of there. I'm um, sort of going back to the quote, right? You know, there's there's a lot of different ways to sort of clean that data, figure out how to make sense of it. You know, if you look at machine learning applications, there'll be uh, many ways to build machine learning models on top of that data. I think you'll see um, startup companies that actually come in and collect sort of the training data sets for those too, right? They're going to be people who are going to pool all of the observational data that's out there right now or build sensor networks to go and collect that data so that you can actually train your machine learning models on it in the future too. Um, so I think those are all sort of potential areas, all sort of around climate, climate risk. Um, obviously, like weather is a, a very popular thing too. Um, as you look at, you know, they, there's a large tornado risk today in, in the Southeast US. Um, you know, there will always be more need for, for better alerting for um, tornadoes and things like that in partnership with, you know, NOAA and the Weather Service, um, who are doing a lot, right? But there are a lot of um, other entities out there who want more finely tuned information and who can benefit, you know, from greater access to that from you know, machine learning models on that that can give them more precise information on how um, the weather will, the severe weather will impact their event. Think about you know, things like people's weddings, um, trips to the, the park and things like that, right? People need to have better access to information on how can we sort of um, understand what the weather is gonna be today and then how can we react to it? I think a lot of the value too is actually in helping um, customers understand what they can actually like, what decisions they can actually make in response to sort of these things. Um, so the tornado being a great example, right? If you say, oh, there's a high risk, you know, 30% chance that there's going to be a tornado within 20 miles of you today. Um, people need more information about what does that mean? What do I do with that information? How can I actually utilize that in my life to make different choices today to sort of mitigate that risk? Um, you can look at that across, you know, the weather and climate domains as well. And, you know, helping folks answer those questions. There'll be a lot of business value there. Wow. Well, let me narrow it into an area that you have a particular focus in, but it's also something West Virginia is unfortunately all too familiar with, and that's flash floods. And the thousand year storm a couple years ago really hit our state hard. And then more recently with the ice storms and the thawing, we have flash flooding in West Virginia. If you thought about what's available today and then what you wish for, what are the gaps that you feel like we have to continue to fill in 
or potentially innovate around that will give us a greater ability to have a little more forewarning on things like flooding? Yeah, so one of the great data sets that NOAA actually makes available is something called the National Water Model. And so it actually, for the first time, uh, a few years ago, they started running that. It produces water level forecasts at 2.6 million points across the US, which was a, a great improvement. I forgot what the original number was. I wanna say it was in the thousands though. Um, so you're seeing you know, a 10 or 100X increase in the amount of data that's available in water levels, including over West Virginia. And so one of the things that you can look at with that is you have all this new information. Now you need to figure out, you know, again, how to sort of calibrate that to the, um, to the people that are potentially going to be impacted, right? So this is water levels in the river. Um, if you know anything about sort of the, the hydrology and hydrologic modeling, you know that like just having the water level in the river, it's actually the water volume in the river, not even the level. Um, so you're trying to convert it to a level to understand, you know, will that home that's, you know, 10 feet above the, uh, the river level be impacted in this flooding event or not? And so there's a lot of work that goes into that. You're seeing NOAA do some of that, but you're gonna need um, other businesses to come out, be created to sort of hyper-localize that information again. Um, so again, it's just an application of taking, you know, NOAA's producing all of these vast quantities of data, um, but people still need to convert that into things that, you know, these very local areas actually understand and is meaningful to them. Um, so for example, you know, like you look at like bridges or something like that, um, people may know that like, oh, the water level always gets to just under the bridge and, and these sorts of heavy rain events. Um, but, you know, someone who's more attuned to that may know and be able to communicate that, oh, the water is actually going to get way over that bridge this time. And so you definitely shouldn't drive over it. And so those sorts of, of information really require sort of the local knowledge to be able to pass on. Wow. Well, now we have a friend in you. So those in West Virginia <laughs> who want to try to solve a problem that touches too many of our lives or our families' lives now know who they can reach out to when they call Zach and say, hey, Zach, you're a part of a program. We want to talk to you a little bit about how we could build this. So Zach, let me ask you, uh, AWS, clearly very familiar with them, been partners for years with Intuit, a very critical player in the tech sector overall. Mm -hmm. When you think about what AWS provides, there's accessibility to data and NOAA's data, and then there's the analytics or what I call the actionability of that data. Mm -hmm. I think the accessibility is pretty well understood. Do you mind drilling a little deeper into the analytics capability that AWS provides in support of the NOAA open data, big data opportunity? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you know, AWS has 175 services. Um, so the vast majority of those services will enable you to sort of work over NOAA's data. Um, one of the interesting things um, recently, there's come up this idea of sort of the lake house architecture. I don't know if that's a, a familiar term with uh, you all or not, but it's sort of the combination of a data lake and a data warehouse. And what's really interesting is you can sort of map that to what NOAA is doing in their big data um, program and how that's able to be utilized using all of the other services in AWS. And so just to give you sort of a brief rundown of the architecture, right? It's you make a data lake in S3 and put all your data there. And so that's sort of what NOAA is doing through the big data program right now is they're putting all of this data into S3. And then what you're seeing is sort of the house, the, the data warehouse architecture is then loading that uh, information into other specific customizable services so you can actually extract the value out of it. Um, so some examples of that in sort of the AWS perspective is things like uh, Redshift. Uh, which is sort of a very traditional uh, data warehousing service. And so you can you know, run SQL queries against that. And so you would take some of these graded forecasts, you'd figure out how to load them in there. Maybe you load them in there only at data points for your specific customers right now. Um, and so that's a, an example of where you can actually utilize the cloud um, and the pay as you go and elasticity to, to save money as you're a startup, right? You don't have to do everything all at once. Um, you know, you'll be able to scale the, the services and as your, as your needs go, as your customer base grows. Um, some other examples of that are, you know, um, working with like Athena to be able to query the data directly in S3. Um, so you'd be able to sort of query that if you have tabular data in there. And also with um, some of the newer functionality that's being created, you'd be able to directly query some of the other formats like NetCDF and, and GRIB files um, with the user-defined functions. Um, so there's actually probably a place for a startup who creates those functions and understands how to utilize them to be able to come and run them against all of the data holdings that uh, NOAA has on AWS. Um, because, you know, pre-converting all of that data, it's very expensive. It, it costs a lot of storage and things like that. Um, but NOAA is making these vast quantities of historical data available. Um, so I just mentioned the National Water Model. They have, uh, I want to say it's 20 years of that data. Maybe it's longer than that. Maybe it's 40 years. Uh, so they ran it as sort of retrospective and they came back and they produced all that data, right? So you can use that and go back and analyze historical floods in West Virginia using some of these services. And so, um, you know, looking at how you can utilize those services as a great business opportunity to, for customers, right? Um, so I just mentioned Redshift and Athena. Um, I was also going to mention, you know, if you look at sort of the, 
container services we have, that's a, uh, a great way to come and build functionality around these data sets that you'll then be able to transport or, or scale as you need to. Um, so those are really sort of the big advantages of the cloud, right? And sort of the agility. So you can come, you can try all these different services. You can figure out which ones are going to be able to work for you. You can do that very quickly. Um, it's all pay-as-you-go pricing and, and on-demand, right? So you're only paying for what you use, and you can quickly turn that off if you decide it doesn't work. Um, it also means that you can try things for cheaply, right? If you were thinking about building a big data warehouse, right? Sort of traditionally, you might be like, oh, I need to go out and, and acquire this big server. That's going to take me, you know, a few weeks to raise the capital, a few months to raise the capital. It's going to take me a few weeks to order it and all of that. Uh, one of the nice things with the cloud, right, is it's sort of on-demand, right? You can just go click a few buttons, and instantly you have access to the resources you need. Um, and so that's really sort of the great model. We sort of refer to that as, you know, turning on the light switch, right? Like you can turn on the light switch and suddenly you just have exactly what you need. Um, and it really enables you to innovate, right? And to be able to uh, move quickly and, and scale up all your problems. Um, and also, you know, the cloud really enables you to have sort of global reach too, right? So we're talking specifically about West Virginia here, because you're thinking of these businesses you know, grow and things like that. You may want to approach other areas of the world too. You may want to run over data they have. Um, you may be subject to sort of data locality requirements for them. Um, if you look, you know, AWS has 24 regions right now. And so you would be able to run in sort of any of those around the globe um, fairly instantly too, right? And so you'd be able to sort of transport your code and your desires there to where the data is. And that's one, you know, these are all sort of the really great values of the cloud and how you can utilize them as you're uh, starting a business. Great. And Zach, I know that you shared in your final slide of your presentation, a way that people can reach out to you and learn about how to partner with you to get access to these amazing tools and services in addition to Noah's big data. Is there anything else you would encourage individuals to say, here's how you can partner with us, or would that be the best and easiest way for them to get access? Yeah, I also mentioned that we have a couple of credit programs specifically for folks that are in universities. Um, so we have something called Cloud Credits for Research. I didn't include links on the slide, but you can email me and I'll, I'll send them to you, um, or we can include them maybe in other materials. But yeah, so you can, um, if you're you know, a graduate student or, or undergraduate student or faculty at a university, you can apply for that program. You write a really short proposal, a few paragraphs, so nothing like most of these folks are used to. Um, and you know, you, you ask for basically what you need to try something out, develop a proof of concept, things like that. Um, so we can support folks through that method. We also have um, a very specific target program called Earth on AWS, uh, which also has a credit application. So if you're doing something specifically with environmental data, Earth data, looking at sort of those geospatial problems, um, you can come to that specific program, uh, which is basically the it's sort of a subset of the Cloud Credits for Research program. Um, so it lets you just more specifically target and hone in and gets you access, you know, to, to me, which you already have access to. So, um, yeah. Perfect. Well, Zach, first of all, I want to tell you, your insights today are incredibly informative, inspiring. Your career is incredibly impressive and your partnership is deeply appreciated. So on behalf of all of those who are Zooming in today, I want to thank you for your time, and I also want to let you know that I look forward to all of us partnering with you going forward. And at this point, if you don't mind, I'm going to say goodbye to you, and I'm going to welcome our next guest panelist. So thank you, Zach, once again for your insights today. Yes, thank you very much. I really appreciate it being here. All right. It's a privilege. And now it's my privilege to introduce our second equally impressive guest panelist, Dr. Sanchez Andrandis. Nuno, who also prefers to be called Bruno, which will work for me. Uh, Bruno is the principal scientist behind Microsoft's AI for Earth. He has a PhD in astrophysics and a postdoc in rocket science. Prior to joining Microsoft, Bruno led the big data innovation efforts at the World Bank. He also led the social impact efforts at SatLogic, and he was also the chief scientist at Mapbox. He's written a book called Impact Science. He's won numerous awards. He is someone that everyone in the industry looks up to. So without further ado, it is my privilege to welcome to the Zoom screen today, Bruno. Hang on, Bruno. We're going to have to unmute you, buddy. What about now? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Thanks, a rocket scientist. <laughs> well, okay, so this has been an amazing, uh, an amazing session. Thank you very much, and thank you, Brad, for for trying to to say my full name. <laughs> it's my privilege. Um, Don't grade me on a curve, Bruno, if you will, please. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. It's a Spanish name, so it's um, it's difficult. 
I wanted to take, before I share with you what we're doing with AI for Earth and Microsoft, I wanted to, to share some, some personal reflection, which is that I come from Spain, as you might notice from my name and my accent, and I come from a region called Asturias, which I believe shares some of the challenges that West Virginia, I understand, faces. Like we are also in Asturias, we're also a rural community, mostly rural community. We come from a legacy of a coal industry and we need to figure out what our future is. We call from a legacy that didn't have that much connectivity and now is trying to do to get more connectivity. We are also a half aging population. A lot of the youth are living for other places like me who came to here to the US. So it's it's fascinating to see this program. And I, I cannot tell you enough how, how these kind of um, sessions are so useful. I wish we had those in my region. So thank you to the West Virginia for doing this for, for, for all of you. And I hope you take this into, into practice. Um, to recap in a sense, let's think about this. We have satellites, literally satellites in a space working. We have fleets of ships getting data. We have um, sonars on the ship of buoys. We have all of this infrastructure getting you an amazing amount of data and then the cables to run it through, the, through all the data service and computer. Then you have companies like Amazon, we was talking about now, or us putting the data together so that you can use it and it's all for free. It's absolutely amazing. If this is not putting your tax dollars to work, I don't know what is. <laughs> so what can we do then with all of that? So we have all of the resources, we have the whole, the, the I, it was very inspiring not only to see the infrastructure that is ready for you, also to see some ideas of the things you're doing and now let's put it to work. So what I want to share with you is some of the things we're doing with the app for Earth. I wanted to keep the eyes on the goal, which is that we have resources for you to start working today. And we have resources like, for example, if you need data, we have, as, as John was mentioning, we have the, the big data program uh, to, to have a lot, of the, a lot of the data in the Azure cloud, but we also have grants to help you run your, your, uh, your ideas. And this is something you can start working on today. So I, I'll, I'll share my slides and share some of the things we're working on. So let's go with this. I think I'm sharing my screen and I'm sharing. Am I sharing the right screen? Can you see the, the slide? Not yet. Oh yeah, let's see when it comes. I'll do it again. Screen one, share. There you go. We can see it now. Well, we can see your home screen. You can see the slides now? Yes, we can. We, we're seeing it in presentation mode with your next slide being viewed. So you might want to go to a slideshow. Um, oh, then you're seeing the other screen. I want to see yes. I want to see the other screen. We're getting oh, a preview of your next slide there. I know how this feels when you go from Microsoft Teams to Zoom and you're trying <laughs> to figure out how to do the transition. So I'm in, uh, I'm in your shoes on this one. I know how it feels. It's like, um, I think this one, it's like, I, it's the first time I do these things since 2021. We've been doing this for a year. It's so perfect. now you can see the things? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay, so that's my email. Um, I'll, put, I'll put it also on the last, um, on the last slide if you wanna send, a, send me an email. Um, and some of the things we're working on, um, one key part that I should be mentioned is that today it seems that you need three PhDs to work in this. One in the topic you're working on, like for example, conservation or land covers or the industry you're working on. You need another PhD in cloud computing and computer science, and you need another PhD in environmental science to put all of this together at scale. So the AI for Earth program aims to lower the barrier of entry for all of that. It aims to give you all of the tools, all of the help so that you can put to work the NOAA data and any other data that, that we can do to, to combine artificial intelligence with Earth. And when we say Earth, we, seen, we talk about monitoring, understanding, managing in terms of sustainability, in biodiversity, in agriculture, in water. We mentioned some of that problems like flash floods and things like that. So that's, that's the kind of thing we do with the r 4 program. We do grants. So we, do, we give up to $10,000 uh, 
in credits for you to start doing your hosting and computing. And remember the data is already available free of charge. So on top of that, you can have all of these all of these credits to, to test around, to see your ideas, to visualize, to work on all of that. We also work with, uh, with everyone basically to improve their technology, to figure out what their code needs to be better, to scale better, to do your work better. We do this both with the startups and commercial companies, but also with NGOs and research. And we host data, you need to do all of this. We have more than 700 projects around the world and from around 100 countries. This is both um, the places where the people are working from and the places they are studying. So this is a, we have a really global reach in that sense. So we offer something which I think is really important, which is a community to share what you're working on, to share your struggles, to see, do we have some, uh, we have summits, uh, two summits around the year. We also have access to the, our whole teams of, of data science and engineers to figure out what you need to do. We also have office hours to, um, to, to talk with, not only with, uh, with our internal experts, but we also do the sessions with external experts to figure out your needs. We, as I mentioned, we have the AFR Summit, but also we have partners, uh, resources, like for example, one of the key tools a lot of people use in this space is Esri, an ArcGIS, and we can offer you a one year response, a one year license to do this software uh, to help you in, in your work and also to procure other data sets, satellite data sets. NOAA has an amazing set of um, satellite images, but sometimes you need higher resolution for other needs and that's something we can help you with too. We have a ton of partnerships to figure out what is the community of stakeholders to figure out how we can achieve our commitments of biodiversity, our commitments to understand and they unlock all of this value for the data. Uh, from technology partners, of course, you see Noah right in the, the first logo on, this, on that quadrant, but also a lot of other partners. We have thing called signature projects where we basically focus on a particular pilot and a particular project, and then we work together. We've done that uh, in Australia with Starbucks, with, in, in India with Mosquito Program, with, in London, and um, in many places. So we also have wide partnerships with academic institutions. I should know that you do, we don't need an academic uh, uh, partnership to, for you to start sending these applications. I mean, so you can start today going to this grants application and, and, and get those credits to start rolling. And we also have grants and competitions, and you, you might have, have seen some of these. We partner with the National Geographic, with Geobomb, with Leonardo DiCaprio's Foundation to do these competitions to help unlock and brainstorm the kind of things you can do with the data. We've seen tons of examples, so I'm just going to throw uh, just a, a couple of them more, and then we can go into the into into questions. So one of the things we do a lot and we like because it's also very visual is camera trap surveys. Uh, it's a key problem in science and research, but also for many other applications to know which animals are where. And usually you have like a camera like tied to a tree and then you just leave it for a month and then you come back and you have a million images and you don't, you don't know how to go through all of those million images and see which ones have animals and which animals are those or people for, um, for protecting it. There shouldn't be people in some places for, for anti-poaching and things like that. So we have um, an AI tool that you just throw all your million images and it tells you in two seconds which images have animals or vehicles or people. Same thing, not with coming up with images, but with sounds. So you wanna know what bird is, is making that sound or what animal or or type of frogs or how many are there. This is also very important for bioacoustic wildlife surveys. So we are working also on those and also uh, land cover. What is uh, urban, what is rural, what is paved, what is not paved, what is water, what is not, for example, in case of flood events to figure out when it's raining, when do we, we have flood events, you can have an image, you run it through this code and then you, know, uh, you can have these land cover surveys. All of this, I would argue, 80% of the things we do are open source. And all of this code, you can go today and start, start testing it out. In some cases, we have demos, so you can just throw the images. And in some cases, if you know a little bit of computer science, you can deploy these things and test it out. And if you want, you are ready to do it at scale, we can, then you can, you can scale it with, with the Azure Cloud. An example of something I mentioned before, which is the land cover, is the need to how machine learning and AI helps you scale. There was a, one of the projects we did 
was um, with the Chesapeake Conservancy and the Chesapeake Watershed, which is it's sizable. It's, uh, it took uh, like a million dollars and 10 months to figure out and go with a person. Okay, this is land, this is rock, this is grass, this is uh, road. And if you want to do that for the whole of UAs, you would need, if you scale that, you would need like 40 years to do those things and you need a lot of money. Instead of doing that, what we did is to, to tell with the images from NOAA and other satellite images, look, this is what the human did and this is what the satellite sees go learn what is what. When you see this on the satellite, this is on, on the land classification. And then you give it the whole images for the whole of the US or the whole world. And then the AI gives a really good job at scaling your efforts. It's like super challenging. It's like an army of, of, of people doing the job that has been trained to do. That's something we did uh, and it was very successful. One other example uh, with NatureServe is the, do something similar to what I said before of the number of species in a particular region, and then you can make a map of how important the biodiversity is in a particular region. And you can do this at a scale once you figure out how to do this with, with machine learning. And also combine that with the roughness of the terrain, so you can prioritize what areas to protect, what areas are more uh, keen for development. Um, a problem that I don't know if you have in West Virginia, but we do have in many other places like in California and across Europe is that trees sometimes get, um, but they get some diseases. And if you don't monitor track and know what is happening, then it could be a big problem. So you can, again, run some images with drones or planes or even satellite images, train an algorithm to know what tree is what, and then which ones are affected by this disease. And then you can run this uh, on a regular basis and know what's happening. This is something, a real example from the Swedish Forest Agency that are tackling with this, this kind of problems. As I mentioned before, a lot of the things I'm talking about are open source and you can go to GitHub and you can go and check it out and, and learn how we did it and learn how we can use it uh, in your own in your own ideas, in your, with your own images. And uh, these are examples also of the, um, the links of the things we did with, for example, NOAA fisheries with belugas. I believe this is the one that John was mentioning before that my colleague Dan was, was doing. So thank you for the shout out in there. Um, going now to the questions and before that, I wanted to emphasize that if you don't have ideas about this point, just go to this page and scroll. It's a really long page of all the things companies, startups, and academics and research have been doing with a quick description of what they did. And these are the grantees. And you can just go scroll to that and see an idea. And then maybe the code is already there. So your job will be to apply it for your for West Virginia, for your uh, for your work. We have the same thing for the partners, which means the, the companies we work with. So if you are already working in a startup or company that wants to improve their code, then, then that's, this is some examples of the things we've done. Um, as I mentioned, we have a lot of NOAA data, of course, that's why we are here talking, but we also have many other data sets, uh, like for example, aerial service like NAPE, which is a one meter resolution is quite high resolution. We have a lot of, the Landsat and Sentinel, we also have data sets aimed for machine learning training, which means we have the images and the labels of the images. So if you wanna train a computer to learn what is a fox and what is a dog, then you have that data to get, uh, get up to speed very quickly. I know it was a lot of information in my talk and I know it was a lot of information the entire day. So I guess the main point Hopefully you know that all of this infrastructure that is coming literally from space to your computers to help you figure out how to do it. And we want you to work that. We want, Noah wants you to work on this and you have resources to start today. So again, this is my email. This is my links to, if you wanna know more and if you wanna get ideas, just reach out and we can start talking how you can put to work all of this amazing data that is available. Wow. Wow, Bruno, first of all, your enthusiasm is contagious. You have me fired up, excited, but most importantly, you made this topic incredibly approachable. You've basically said, look, we're gonna lower the barrier. That's not lower the bar. Everyone has something to contribute. Some of us may not have a PhD, but there are ways that we can go in and we can be inspired and we think about problems to be solved. And so you're basically turning us all into citizen developers. And then I love the portfolio of ways that you support. 
you have a community, you have grants. One of the things we often hear is, well, I have an idea, but I don't have any resources. Well, that excuse has been taken away now. You have competitions. And then I loved how you even had a repository, a gallery of here's things that may inspire you that others are solving. And by the way, if you like that, here's the access to the code. And last but not least, I love how you got the education community also involved in this because we need to be not only getting people excited about this early in their lives, but teaching them some of the skills so they can capitalize on these resources. So first of all, I just wanted to summarize by saying that was an amazing and inspiring sort of overview of everything that you're doing. And I know that was only scratching the surface. What I wanted to do is I wanna take that energy now and ask you a big question. If you were sitting out there in one of the locations in West Virginia or someplace else that is zooming in and you know you had this access to NOAA's data and you have the partnership of Microsoft Azure, AWS and others, how excited would you be about this entrepreneurial opportunity and what would you focus on first if it was you starting something? Mm, well, in my case, I have tons of ideas I'd like to figure out and well, that's I, I guess I ended up where I am now because I, I work on these things and I've seen a lot of a lot of the struggles. I also, as you mentioned, I work in the World Bank for a while. And you know, they used to people used to say that um, skills are equally distributed, but opportunities are not. And it's very true still today in many cases, but when it comes to satellite image of the whole world, when it comes to resources to put it to work, when it comes to this cloud computing, today opportunities are equally distributed. The things that the West Virginia people can do can also be done by anyone who has some connectivity. So what I would say is like, if you already have an idea and I would have ideas, for example, what you mentioned on, on extreme events, on flooding, so it's, it's a big one. Like the, one of the biggest drivers of, um, of economic losses now is extreme events. So if you are living in a community that suffers uh, extreme events of droughts, and I think in this case it's more floods or maybe deforestation, or maybe your trees have these diseases, then figure out how no, I can help you do this, help you figure out what, what to monitor the situation and what can we do about it. Maybe it's just raising awareness of that. And then it means, for example, like the Swedish example of training a model to detect what trees are affected or not, or putting a camera on a tree and then going a week later and see what animals you 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 see. I would argue that one of the one of the things I love of, of how my mind works is that it has an immense sense of curiosity. And if you have curiosity, feed it. Training is like a muscle, yes. Okay, just wanna make some images and, and just, just go, with your, go with your curiosity. It will lead you to amazing places. And if you have an idea, go with it. If you don't have an idea what to do, just, just go with your curiosity. I assure you, you will learn a lot. You will have the motivation to learn the things that maybe are harder to do, like how to do machine learning which is getting as easier and easier, and then you will be already on your path to solve some of the biggest challenges in the world. Wow. Great advice. Go with your curiosity. Feed your curiosity. I know that Satya Nadella, obviously your CEO, talks about he looks for curiosity quotient. He looks for learn-it-alls versus know-it-alls, someone who's constantly on that learning journey, and I love that. So let me ask you, as you are sitting there and you have this treasure trove of assets and you have a lot of it that you've made consumable so that citizen developers and other individuals can participate, what's the gap out there right now? So where is the area that you say, I think we can make big advances if we can only solve this issue. There's a gap here that we've got to figure out how to overcome. This, I think there's a big gap. And that's also the reason I brought that book of impact science. But anyway, of course, if, if you want it, I'm happy to send to you the manuscript. There's no need to buy it, but if you want, that's great. So the one of the biggest barriers is that in my experience, what I've seen, what universities tend to focus on going very deep on the skills, not going broad in the sense of interdisciplinary. It's really hard. And I'm sure there are institutions and you're trying to do that. So Still, I would argue that those who know computer science tend not to know what are the challenges, for example, in biodiversity, or in economy, or in ecology, or in socioeconomic development. And those who know about those things tend not to know about computer science. So this is chasm of those with the power, with the tools, and those with the questions who need answers. So what I would focus on, I would encourage is to just join those. Just have a session where you have the computer scientists and those who know more about these tools and those who might have the need for these questions. And then combining that is something that 
would unlock a lot of value. And that's, that's the thing that I, that I try to focus my life a lot. Look, I'm an astrophysicist. Why is an astrophysicist working at the World Bank? It makes no sense because my knowledge of the sun using NOAA data is might not be useful for eradicating poverty. If you think that I'm valuable for the knowledge that I have, but if I am valuable for the skills I have, then I can apply those skills for the modeling of the sun, but I can have the skills too to understand what's happening with this data, understand what's happening with this disease, understand what's happening with this flood, because it's the same is math. At the end of the day, a lot of the things we need to do is logic, assumptions, hypotheses, falsable hypotheses, all of these things. So I would focus a lot on this interdisciplinary combination of the those with the skills of computer science and science and physics and biology, and those with uh, the application areas. Oh, you've opened up an opportunity for me to share this with the audience and for those that are maybe in West Virginia. Um, you just talked about it's not the knowledge, it's the skills. I've often shared two things when I talk to this audience and then I'm gonna come back to you and ask you to build on this. One is I said, if my car ever broke down anywhere, I would want it to break down in West Virginia for two reasons, because the people would be kind enough to stop and crafty enough to fix it. And then the second part of that craftiness is if you go back into the history of the state, the mountains were too tough for a lot of people. They couldn't settle there, but the West Virginia mountaineers that came in and settled that state realized they were gonna blaze trails instead of follow paths. And they became innovators and entrepreneurs and they figured out how to make the best out of the circumstances. And what you're talking about here is literally saying, look, I can see a problem. I know that problem needs to be solved. I may not have the knowledge, but I have the skills and I'm gonna find someone who has the knowledge in that particular domain. And together we can tackle this problem. And so as I think about that, and I step back and I ask myself about some of the slides you shared from the Microsoft gallery, is there an example in that gallery? I know we will go and we'll scroll down, but is there one in particular that inspires you where there was this meeting of minds that did something that could not have happened by one individual? In other words, is there one that just jumps out and says, wow, this is my favorite use case on that gallery? I would, okay, I would go one step further and say why I'm in the job that I have right now is because the thing that inspires me the most is the whole hypothesis of the whole program of AI for it, which is, we have an amazing group, of, uh, knowledge creation, knowledge awareness, which is these grantee communities. We also have these challenges in the world from like employability or these um, this extreme events we talked about or what's, what's gonna happen with our nature. The hypothesis that gets me really excited is how can we work not only to create the knowledge but to transport it to other stakeholders, meaning governments, local governments, regional governments, national governments, to companies. This transfer from research to operations is the key to unlock the change we wanna see in the world. And I'm extremely excited because of Microsoft, we are in an extremely privileged position that if we, when we, not if, when, because we're already doing that, when we work in this transfer, we are in a much more, much better position to unlock those, that value. We are a corporate cloud. We have clients everywhere, right? So if we make sure that the science can be done in the Azure cloud, we also make sure the science can be applied. And that is, to me, that is what is extremely exciting, not only from the Microsoft positions, obviously, but also because it allows anyone to get their research and their knowledge to work at the most scalable levels to the impact we want to see. That's what really excites me. Wow. You know, it reminds me of one of the famous scientists from some microsystems back in the day, Bill Joy, who used to say, no matter how many smart people we have sitting under our roof, there's one fact that's true. There are more smarter people out there in the world because you can't get them all under one roof. So opening up these assets, thinking about it as a community, coming together and saying, how do what you bring and what does I bring actually connect in a way that we can solve a problem no one else can solve. That's what you're talking about is you expose these assets and then you challenge people to follow their curiosity. I think yeah. it's amazing. So if you had a closing message for the audience, something that you hope they take away from today's session, not just your segment, but all the other segments that led up to it, what would be that inspiration or that motivation you wanna leave everyone with? That's a tall order, Brad. I think you should be the one doing that message. But from my point of view is that, as I tried to say in the beginning of my session, we've seen there's a whole fleet of satellite ships and infrastructure to help you today start doing the thing that inspires you or you are curious about. There is literally no excuse. 
there is literally no excuse for you to start today going online and search air for earth grants, send your application, super, super short application, getting your credits on, you have already the petabytes of data in the cloud and start putting this to work. And if you have questions, you can reach out to us. My email was, was there and also my colleague, Laura Dobbs, which is also in the audience, shout out to her, is we are ready to figure out how we can help you put the NOAA data and start working on, on these solutions. Wow, well, Bruno, I wanna tell you, if you just think about what we're talking about here today, we have a huge unsolved problem that everyone in the world has to deal with. Climate change, weather, and the effects that has on everything from our livelihoods to our lives. Then you have this massive amount of data that's available. When you have NOAA saying, we're gonna open source this and make it available for everyone. Then you have these amazing partners like Microsoft Azure. You also have Amazon Web Services. You have Google Cloud Platform saying, we're gonna make these tools and these programs available to you. And then you have the raw material of the entrepreneurs, the educators, the students that are sitting on this call right now saying, what can I do with this treasure trove of, of assets to solve this big important problem and improve the life for everyone? So I can say today, I had the pleasure of sitting with a lot of people, everyone whose name began with a doctor, except for me, I'm Brad from Canova. And if we can all lean in and get excited about this and think about ways we can be a part of this process, there is no way to stop us. So with that, Donna, I'm going to thank Bruno for an amazing session today. I also wanna thank Zach from Amazon Web Services, and I'm gonna hand it back to you to carry on with the rest of the program.